This is the 2.5 Conversations Connecting Innovators, Episode 2. My name is Klaus. In this episode, my guest is Marty Neumeyer, a designer, ideas man, brand expert and teacher. We will be talking about that you don't have to be a genius to be an innovator, about the importance of dreaming as an innovator as well as making and continuous learning, about the importance of a vision for making to get to results, about focusing and leaving out the BS in business books, and about learning from the Grateful Dead. Martin Neumeyer is an ideas man and a teacher in the best sense of the word. He has written several books about branding, creativity and innovation. The Brand Gap, SAG and The Designful Company are among his books that became classics. He is full of energy and ideas and the conviction and hope that his ideas truly add value for the readers or his course participants. He just added master classes to his line of focused business books. Let's start the conversation. Marty, thank you very much for taking your time uh, talking with me on uh, the 2.5 podcast. I'm very honored and um, I'm a big fan for a long time now. And uh, well, welcome. My pleasure, Klaus. Marty, are you aware of the Neumeyer station uh, in the Antarctica uh, near the South Pole? I am not. I'm, maybe I should be. <laughs> I'm going to look that up. Is it spelled the same? No, actually, it's not spelled the same, but... Uh, yeah. uh, But uh, Neumeyer is uh, is a, a German name actually, and mm -hmm. uh, and it's the name of the the Antarctic station situated on on some iceberg in in the south. Um, An iceberg, yes, yeah, some yeah. sort of iceberg. Yeah. My my ancestors came over to <clears throat> to the U.S. in probably 1880, something like that. Uh, great 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 grandfather and grandmother. They I think they got married and then came here, uh, came to the U.S. Um, and, and that's kind of all we know, <laughs> because it's like we don't know about our, our, our past. Uh, it's all been sort of erased by immigration. Yeah, but I, I like um, that you have kept your name, Neumeyer, which is kind of the, the German spelling, but the, uh, the uh, English uh, pronunciation. So, well, yeah. yeah, we just give, give up trying to correct people, right? <laughs> <laughs> If they want to call you Neumeyer, you just nod and go, yes, that's fine. Yeah, it's the same with, with my name. Uh, I was so happy when Star Trek uh, introduced uh, Commander um, Reichert. His name yeah. is sort of spelled differently a, a bit, but now I can say it's like in Star Trek. Um, <laughs> and and uh, so it's because Reichert in its original pronunciation is just impossible it's to fine. pronounce in yeah. English. everyone six what do you do you zag <laughs> you zag <laughs> zag obviously okay yeah. obviously why obviously is is it about breaking rules all the time uh no not all the time but where it counts you you have you know you have to be different so uh you know we, are, we all have a tendency to follow the leader that's how we learn <clears throat> but you can't be a leader by following the leader eventually you have to break away and ask people to follow you. So the most successful companies are the ones that have followers, that have imitators. So uh, imitators don't do well in the marketplace though. They always make, you know, their profit margins are less and so forth. So you want to be number one in your in your niche or your, your marketplace, your space. Uh, and you can't do that by copying number one. Okay. Uh, basically, what you could do is copying number one and reduce the price, which is actually not a nice position to be in, I, I think. Yeah, um, branding isn't about lower prices unless unless that's your whole idea. That could be a, a strong brand, but uh, usually it's about getting more people to buy more stuff uh, at higher prices for more years. Yes, to have some consistency um, in the the way you deliver a product, that you, you build trust with uh, with um, your customers, and uh, that people can know what to expect when when uh, when they buy something from you. Yeah. But that's sort of sometimes in the way for uh, for innovators because if you do something really new, people don't know about this. 
uh, they don't know what to expect because it's something that was not around before. Yeah, it's difficult. If you have something completely new, you have to teach people what it is and why it's of some value to them, and that's difficult. So it's usually better to to um, relate it to something they already understand. Okay. I understand that teaching is really an important thing for you. Um, you're not a university teacher, you're not a teacher at school and stuff like that, but you write business books. You, you pick the, the, the business book as a medium for teaching. And uh, you have a very different approach to, to business books. I think your, your books are very different. Um, there is always not a lot of pages. There is always a worksheet. There might be a video. And um, they are always sharp to a point or to the point they, are, they want to make. There is no BS uh, involved, at least from my point of view. Uh, how come you don't like BS? <laughs> oh, well, you know, it's, it's just so time consuming you know, for people. Why not just get to the point? Um, that's the whole idea of, of being a communicator, right? Is to get to the point quickly and make it stick. And that's a skill that I've honed by being a, a graphic designer for many years, early in my career, and then a copywriter. And the whole idea of being a copywriter is you grab somebody with a headline, uh, with some sort of promise, and you, by the after about a hundred words, you've you've got them to buy something, or at least be open to buying something. And I don't see why a business book should be any different. I don't. I don't think more is better in a business book. In other words, why just throw you know a hundred thousand words at people with you know uh, you know ten thousand ideas when they can't remember more than four or five in, anyway? So I just think stick to a couple of good ideas, make sure people remember them, and can unpack them over time. In other words, every time they um, think back about a principle they find a way to apply it. So um, so simplicity doesn't mean simple-mindedness. It means um, compression. That's the way I look at it. You take a big idea and you compress it uh, down to something small enough for people to, to get their heads around, and, but all the information is still in there. And so that, that thing that they remember reminds them of all the other things they need to know, rather than treat all information as equal. You know, because in a business book, some things are more important than other, th other things. So you need to make sure people understand the hierarchy of importance. Okay, but everybody else or many other authors are taking a different route. And uh, so what you do basically is you're not taking the safe route uh, that everybody else is doing. Yeah, that's right. I'm differentiating. Okay, so it takes guts. Yeah, well, yeah, it does, but it's almost the other way is almost guaranteed to be to be a failure. So by by just doing what other people are doing, um, you have no reason to be in the world. Right? <laughs> Who needs you? <laughs> so that to me, that's that's dangerous. Uh, it's much safer to strike out, at least be you know be a little bit different, um, and try to try to find an audience, a constituency for what you're doing than it is to just be a pale imitation of somebody else or copy someone else and make a few superficial changes to what they're saying. To me, that's, that's a waste of time and, uh, and uh, you know, it's, it's dangerous to your career because you've spent all that time doing something that nobody's going to really care about. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, there's still a lot of books that are, let's put it that way, famous. But nope. that probably also end up on the couch table, having being read for just a, a few pages or the first chapter, and yeah. um, and now you, you could you could argue you're just plain lazy because you you don't write a lot. Uh, <laughs> sorry, well, it's hard, it's hard. Uh, but yeah. I'm also quoting or paraphrasing you. I've just tried to make it simple, and but from my experience, it is much harder to make something simple and to come up with something minimal than to sort of elaborate. Yeah, yeah, that's where the work is, is continually polishing it till you get it to the simplest possible expression uh, that's true um, and useful, right? I mean, something could be true and not useful. So you want it to be both. Um, and, you know, I arrive at these, I call them conceptual toys. They're just little 
ideas that um, you can play with um, that are fun uh, and don't demand too much, uh, you know, cognitive work to, to understand. Um, and, you know, I spend every morning in the shower just trying to figure out how can I explain this to somebody, you know, how, whatever point I'm thinking of, what's the best way to explain this? Um, and so I put a lot of work into it, hours just for one sentence sometimes. But those sentences um, all uh, piece together into one uh, integrated whole. And so that, that makes it even a little bit harder. So everything, I hope that everything I say in all my books makes sense with everything else I've said in my books, <laughs> that I don't contradict myself. So ha have you uh, encountered that situation that you contradicted yourself in a later book? Yes. <laughs> yeah, early on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not so much anymore because I'm aware of it now. But, um, but the thing is, once you write a book, it's there forever. So yes. <laughs> be careful. <laughs> yes. Uh, in, in my For my uh, PhD uh, uh, research, I spent a lot of time in, in the libraries looking at really, really, really old books, like a three, four hundred year old books. And that's quite scary if you think about that, uh, that things yeah. can be as, around for such a long time. Um, yeah. <laughs> but even in, uh, let's wonder if, if there will be a, an, like an ebook reader for uh, in, in 200 years that will be capable of reading today's books. But uh, still, uh, I have the problem with uh, this book that uh, I've got from you. It was the first book that I got, and it's the Innovators Innovation Toolkit. Uh, sorry, and it's a combination of video and, and uh, a book. And I am running into the problem that I don't have a DVD player anymore. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> so I can still read, but uh, the stuff on the electronic stuff on the on the silver di silver disc is just not accessible anymore. Uh, but I've seen that you have you're also offering this as a as a download uh, on the web, which is yeah. I don't even think it's available as a product other than a download. Um, uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah that that whole technology is gone. So. <laughs> You see that you contradict yourself sometimes in, in later books, which sort of is a, a, a thing that is connected to learning also. So for you as a, as a person, as a designer, as a human being, is it very important to have be such a lifelong learner? Oh, of course it is. That's, I mean, that's the advantage of living long. You have more time to learn things and um, Uh, get better at things and be more yourself, all those kinds of things. Uh, it's a gift if you can, you know, the longer you live, the more chance you have. Um, although I, I don't think I'd want to live forever. I'm okay. a big fan of a normal life, lifespan, but um, some people do, you know, there are people that really want to live forever and would if they could. If they could take a pill and live forever, they'd do it. Mm -hmm. uh, they're all in Silicon Valley. <laughs> 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 so, um, I understand that uh, that might be a, a nice possibility. Uh, there's also vampires that live forever. Uh, yeah. And I understand it doesn't really appeal to me to <laughs> lead such a life uh, uh, away yeah. from everybody else. Um, well, I'm not really a night person either. <laughs> me too. I like the mornings. Um, but actually, uh, to, to be able to see these things uh, and to... Um, to you have to be sort of knowledgeable of a lot of things. You have to have made a lot of experiments. You have to have uh, have talked to a lot of people. And uh, then there is this big uh, phrase, uh, and I don't remember from whom this is, that the more you know, the the more you wonder about what you know. Uh, yeah. Is that a, sort of a problem for you? Uh, always, yeah, it's true. The more you know, the more you question everything, uh, including yourself. Uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm threatening to write a book someday called uh, Confessions of a Brand Man uh, as a sort of tribute to David, David Ogilvy, who wrote Confessions of an Advertising Man back in the 60s. But when you read his book, the confessions aren't really confessions. <laughs> They're basically uh, stories of how great he is, you know. <laughs> but I have no stories like that. I have no stories of greatness about me. Um, but I think it might be interesting to see what a struggle It is to to learn this kind of thing and be successful in a uh, an area like branding, which is fairly abstract. Branding or communication or strategy; these are all fairly abstract disciplines uh, with a lot of failure. 
And um, the only reason I can write about this at all is because I've failed so many times. I don't think there's any other way. I, I, I've used up all the ways of failing. So <laughs> <laughs> I've tried them all. Uh, and I'm the kind of person that always does the wrong thing first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you, you hit your... Um... You hit your knees uh, a lot, and it hurts a lot, and left your marks on on the legs. Um, uh, that sounds like you you don't think you're a genius yourself. I do not. Well, let me take that back. I think everybody's a genius at something, almost everybody, or at least they have the opportunity to be a genius at something, but probably not everything. Um, I, I really believe that people should, in in the course of their lives specialize in something fairly early uh, to master it and get a feeling for what the, you know what that's like to master something and then spread out from there as opposed to learning everything a little bit and then finding that um, you don't know anything really very deeply. Uh, I think that experience of going deep into a subject is really important. It's also important to know enough about the world that you can bring other ideas into your specialty. And from there, you can leap over to another specialty and add that on. You can go laterally. But um, that's the way I'd like to see people learn. I think it works better, but that's maybe that's just me. Mm -hmm. But does that mean that you focus on the strengths that you have or focus on the weaknesses and build on that? I think you want to neutralize your weakness is while you build on your strength. Okay. And eventually, maybe some of those weaknesses turn around and they become strengths. But uh, I think, you know, the problem we all have is we have to compete in the world, right? We have to find a place to stand that where we can do something better or in a, a new way to separate ourselves from everybody else. Otherwise, we're not very valuable. We're just, uh, you know, interchangeable parts in a in a business world. So um, we want to have something we can say, look, this is the thing I do better than anybody else. And I want to be paid for that, right? I want to be paid more than someone else. So if you don't have that, uh, it's, it's just more of a struggle. And so that's what I, I wrote a book called meta skills that talks about that. Um, meta skills are skills that let you learn other skills. Like um, if you're a good learner that helps you, learn about other things, you know, or that's, that's called, you know, similar to metacognition. It's knowing what you need to know, um, or feeling what you need to feel <laughs> these sorts of things. There's five of them I think are important, uh, in a world where innovation is crucial. Um, and the book was really a watershed for me because I, I learned learned a lot from all the research I did. It's a, it's a, unlike my other books, it's, you know, it's big, it's 350 pages, um, 30 pages of notes, um, you know, tiny type, uh, where all this stuff came from. And, um, uh, I, I really started to um, think about how, how much we need to change education to be in tune with the world that requires more problem solving, uh, more creativity, uh, more human interaction. Um, and 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 because because the old way of learning and the, the old schooling system just doesn't work. It doesn't work as well. Mm. It's too much like a, it's built on a factory model. You know, where everybody learns the same thing, and they come out at the end with a, you know, the same time. <laughs> they mm. start at the same time. They end at the same time. They learn the same things. Everything they learn is already known. You know, so yeah. how do you teach people to learn things that aren't known? I, I think it's really interesting that you coming from the US say something that everybody in, for example, Germany, which I have a better grasp on, um, on what is going on, is also saying. And, um, and from what I understand, you say is, is something that it starts with feeling, uh, it uh, goes on with seeing, then there's dreaming, making, which sort of is the opposite of dreaming, and then again, learning. And I was quite yeah. fascinated by these seemingly different things uh, or contradictory things in this list. Yes, they are. They're, they're, um, I think they're complementary. So, uh, so feeling and seeing are complementary. Feeling is um, about intuition and emotion and uh, 
that sort of thing. And then seeing is more about uh, systems, understanding systems. So it's more logical. Um, those two things need to be together. They're, they're sort of opposites, but they need each other. And then um, uh, making and uh, what's the other one? Dreaming. Dreaming. Dreaming uh, is kind of wishing or, you know, thinking to yourself, wouldn't it be cool if? What if? Yeah, what if? Uh, and you can what if yourself to death, right? <laughs> and never achieve anything. <laughs> You know, I mean, you have to make stuff. So yes. dreaming is no good without making it. And if you don't know how to make it, so you need you need those skills, design skills, making skills. Uh, but making without having a, a vision is not going to get you anywhere either. And then learning is sort of the opposable thumb of the five things. Learning is um, just kind of accelerates all the other four. Mm -hmm. And so that the kind of learning I'm talking about there is really more formal learning either by reading or going to school or um, mm -hmm. taking classes, going to workshops, sort of formal things. Yes. Like that. And some people are good at that and some people aren't. So it's, but it's good to be good at it. All those things feed off of each other. They all relate to each other and make each other better. Okay. Well, for, for teaching or for learning, there's uh, several mediums to do that. And um, you talk a lot about, or you, you have written a lot of books and you talk about books. And books are a great way, an accepted way for several hundred years to learn something new and uh, also get into some, bring the reader in some sort of transformation um, to do his or her job better, for example, to learn something about something that this person has never been exposed to before, some or a new point of view or a new skill. Mm -hmm. um, but a book also has boundaries. Now we have um, video, we have courses, uh, well, courses are were around for thousands of years, but we have online courses, for example, and stuff like that. So what is not teachable via a book or what is best teachable via a book uh, well that's a good point i think uh, what's teachable by a book is writing because <laughs> they're written <laughs> <laughs> so you can learn to be a writer from reading books you don't even need to take a class although i still think having a class and having a mentor would you know help anybody yes uh, and having peers who could review each other's work so all that's really important You know, they all have their advantages. I, I think people overvalue what video can teach uh, as opposed to books. I think books just pack a lot more inside, but you need to be able to unpack it. You need to be a good reader, a critical reader. You need to be willing to take those ideas and try them out. Um, so people who don't have that sort of, um, they're not self-propelled into doing that might do better if they're in a group where there's some peer pressure to do the work, right? So that would be school. Yes. Classes. Um, but I think they're all, you know, everybody has a, their own way of learning and they think, I think they should gravitate towards those things that work for them. Um, but I certainly wouldn't rule out reading. I, I'm, I'm not counting books on the, on the uh, endangered species list. <laughs> uh, Oddly enough. Yeah. I mean, I think they're, they're just, they're underappreciated in the U.S. because we have so much technology and we're doing so many cool new things that people are distracted from, from books. Um, and that's one of the reasons I prefer uh, Europe. People read, they have bookstores here. It's, it's great, it makes me feel great. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm actually thinking of maybe moving my publishing activities to Europe where There's, there's more effort going into the production of books and there's more readers mm -hmm. making that the center of my center of gravity. So I'm looking into that on this trip, among other things. Um, and, I, and I probably will do video courses uh, someday uh, if I should live long enough. Uh, but right now I'm, I'm focusing on um, live master classes yes. uh, for people who are really serious. So, so what you started to do is uh, offering these live masterclasses. And um, what I understand is, is that one of the, the first ones or, or, or second uh, year now is, is happening in Europe in this October. 
Now with this, yes, we, we, we did the first one in London and uh, that was in March and that was a big success. So we decided to do more cities with the same class. It's the level one class. There's gonna be five levels. Level one is the basic, you know, branding 101. It's a great class in, in a lot of people. That's all they need is the first level and they'll be transformed. Their whole idea of branding will be transformed. Um, so we, we're bringing it back to London uh, and also Hamburg, uh, Lausanne, Glasgow, uh, Bordeaux is now closed, um, but those five. Uh, and then we'll be coming back again in uh, probably April, I think, something like that with uh, the second course. And so you can take two if you want, if you're very ambitious, you could take one then two. Uh, <laughs> I think it might be too much for people to do that, but that would, um, would be for the genius amongst us. It's for um, geniuses only for that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, the second the second master class will be focused on um, strategy. So brand strategy goes deeply into that. It'll be a very fascinating class. Um, and I'm loving these classes because the people who come are very very motivated. They're they're pros already. They're already in the field, working in the field or at least the graduates of a, of a program uh, in marketing or uh, strategy, business, something like that. And, and uh, they just bring a lot of energy to it. And, and, and for some of, them, some of them, it's the first time they've worked collaboratively with other people in other uh, disciplines. So, you know, we break into teams and we take a fictitious, we, we create a project for each team. Uh, and then they take it in two days, they take it from beginning to end and they prototype that brand. Um, and what's really kind of surprised me is how much people bonded over the first one. I mean, little businesses started up after people met in this class, they started working together and collaborating either um, sort of unofficially or even in creating new business, business relationships with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and other people got um, better jobs. <laughs> After this, <laughs> really better jobs. Um, thumbs up. Yeah, thumbs up. Um, the idea, though, is that if you take all five at, at the, when, and you graduate from all five uh, levels in, in the program, you are um, able to t take on the role of CBO, Chief Brand Officer, in a large company, which is a new role that's just emerging. And it's a very, um, it's, it's a role of, high responsibility uh, and, and high uh, compensation, mm -hmm. higher than anyone ever thought. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost up there with CEO status. So um, that's not for everybody. We're not gonna have a lot of graduates, but um, we've already got people from the very first class taking those kinds of roles just from the first class. Amazing. So um, I, don't, I can't explain why I think they were already very talented before they took the class, but I think it just gave them um, probably a better understanding of where they fit and what their value is. Um, other people reported that they, they just landed huge clients that they never thought they could handle, and now they have a really um, a better understanding of how to structure the work. So um, I'm really encouraged just, just to keep doing this, and um, I hope that uh, some some pros from Germany come to the, the Hamburg class. Uh, it's October 29 and 30. Okay. Thursday, Friday. We'll provide a link in the, um, oh, uh, in the podcast go. description and the episodes yeah. description. Yeah, they can go to levelc.org level to see what it's about. Yeah, so, so you, that way you, you introduced um, another way to, to interact with... Um, um, brand um, education, let's put it that way. It's not a good word. Uh, I'm just lacking some words. Uh, another way also to interact with you, because in the book it's just uh, it's uh, there's uh, the personal voice on on the pages. But you will be uh, attending these classes. You will be uh, hosting the classes. Yes. No, it's the it's uh, the most fun thing I do is interact with everybody and. Uh, Uh, just get in the playpen with them, you know, <laughs> and uh, see what we can learn together. Um, and then I have my partner, Andy Starr, who helps. He helps set them up and runs the business part of it. And he also is a, a, a great uh, teacher and um, uh, helps the teams, goes around and helps the teams uh, compete with each other. Okay. Uh, 
It's it's really fun it, and uh, very learningful. Learningful is that a word? Learningful. It's it's a good word. You, you refer to the brand office and that new role uh, that is sort of upcoming. Uh, does that have anything to do with the popularity of design thinking? It would definitely include design thinking because branding is depends on design uh, design thinking, which means design thinking is is essentially thinking with your hands, you know. So you 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 imagine something that wasn't there before. Uh, you you um, prototype it. You see if it works. You make changes to it. You prototype it again. You test it in the marketplace. Uh, these that's the process for creating anything new. So um, so I would say the chief brand officer is the most important person in 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 teaching the company how to do this at every level. I mean, I think design thinking isn't just for designers. It's just a way of approaching a problem uh, yes. where you don't know the answer in advance. You know, there's no formula for finding out the answer. You have to test. You have to try out things. You have to imagine a solution. Um, and, and if you haven't been taught how to do that, that's pretty scary. So I would think a chief brand officer would be running classes or making sure that people um, understood the process of design thinking because it applies to uh, anything in a business, really. It's, it's uh, how a, uh, a salesperson um, uh, persuades a, a, a nice client, a, a good client, to come along with the with the program. You know, with the to buy something from the company. Um, it could be uh, how strategists think, um, how all the all the the elements of branding are put together. Um, new processes in the company. How do we work together? That's all design thinking can explicate that too. Mm -hmm. And it introduces the idea uh, of creativity that people can be creative uh, even if they themselves don't really think of themselves as being creative. No, we're all creative. Yeah, we don't think so often and often we're not consciously creative but we don't we don't understand the the process of creativity and so i think that's something everyone could could learn from i think they'd be really surprised at how creative they are if they're doing it deliberately um and they're they're actually you know there are ways to to get at that and uh, you know I've, i've taught workshops on that too and i can say that almost everybody uh surprises themselves when they know how to do it so you don't need to be a genius to be an innovator. No, you don't. No. I do believe in genius, but I believe that everyone's everyone has a the ability to be a genius in something if they can find it and develop it. Um, and what happens is a lot of people don't realize they have that potential or are afraid to um, to explore it because maybe it doesn't exist already maybe there is no category for that kind of genius that they would fit into they have to create it and so you know we're all learning how to um, express ourselves in the best possible way and make the most of our lives and i think there's a lot to learn from design thinking processes about that and in fact there's at stanford they're they're running classes on um using design thinking to to um to envision your career and to 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 uh To guide you along your career, mm -hmm. I think it would be a great help for young people. It sounds strange because, but I'm 50. Um, to have such a course done by you because you come to the point, straight to the point. Uh, you would you could help a lot of young people with doing such a course. Yeah, I hope I am. That's what I'm trying to do. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, I'm writing books about it. Um, and I'm giving workshops where I'm, where I have a sponsor, but I don't have a way right now of running design thinking workshops on their own, but it's, it's folded into my brand workshops. So it's part of those. Okay. And, and we'll hit, we'll, we'll hit that pretty hard in uh, level three, I think of, of it. it hasn't been designed yet. So we'll see. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> maybe maybe there's a small spin off for especially aimed at at young people trying to find that certain thing in their lives. Well, I hope it'll just be taught in, at university. I mean, yes. It should be. It should be. Uh, it should be I mean, taught it, at school. 
yeah, at the school period and you know, or, or trade school. Um, you know, it's not it's not just a white collar um, skill. I mean, everyone should learn how to do this. Okay, so so you you're a believer in some sort of method toolkit that helps us to um, to sort of develop creativity, develop some sort of idea uh, methodology to um, to see a vision um, to sort of create create things. Yeah, to create things, and it doesn't matter if you're a doctor or a lawyer. You know, you don't think of lawyers creating anything, but I think they can be very creative and often are. Mm -hmm. um, Creativity and problem solving are are, are almost um, siblings. You know, they 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 use the same um, skill set. Um, you know, Sherlock Holmes. Uh, you know, think of him as uh, really logical, but he was inventing solutions to problems. Right? He could imagine a solution, and then he wasn't okay. just reading the tea leaves. And then tracking back to the to the original of the of the problem yeah. to the murderer or to, and stuff. Yeah, and I see what you mean. Yeah. Is there a, an exercise? Uh, we could name it the Sherlock Holmes exercise. No, but but is there an exercise that that you um, uh, like a simple thing that you uh, uh, recommend to people to to do something like that to yeah, for individuals to be that. innovative? Well, one that I like, and it's it's not mine. I mean it. it has existed for years is where you um, you tr you try to find you, you look at a subject area let's, let's say you're trying to invent something new um, with a brand or a company or a product you 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 make a list of everything that's known about that like what are the assumptions about that subject area um, and then you reverse those Uh, and you see what happens when you reverse it. Usually you come up with the world's worst idea. <laughs> Because there's a reason why that successful thing is the way it is, or that successful industry. But in reversing it, um, you, you, you um, look at it from a different perspective, and then you can say, okay, so that's horrible, but uh, what would we have to change about that reversed idea to make that a winner? So you're starting from a different place, a very wrong place. Mm -hmm. Remember I said I do everything wrong at first? Yes. I think it's helped me quite a bit <laughs> in some ways. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, let's say that um, you want to reinvent banking, retail banking. That's a subject everybody knows a lot about because we all use a bank. All right, so you make a list of all the things that banks are like. What's it like to go to the bank? What does the bank look like? What, is it, what do the bankers do? Uh, well, let's see, when you go to the bank, It's usually in a retail space, uh, and it might have some columns in the front, and um, maybe um, uh, some teller windows where you go mm -hmm. up to the teller and you you know you wait in line, you go up and you do your transaction. It's got a safe in the back. It's it's usually very solemn uh, because it's serious business. It's money. Yes. Um, and uh, you don't you don't uh, you don't you know take your lunch in there and eat it or anything like that. <laughs> you, you know, you, you wear shoes. It's not relaxed. To, not relaxed. Uh, and that's fine. But what if you just said, well, what's the opposite of that? Well, it's, it's, it's not in a retail space. It's, uh, you, can, you, you can go in barefoot. You can bring food. You can bring your dog. Mm -hmm. um, there's no teller windows. Um, maybe there's no, no tellers. Um, so, and you go, well, that's, that would be the weirdest bank ever. But then you think, well, okay, maybe, maybe it's um, it's not in a normal, you know, it's not in the high rent district in town. It's in like where all the art galleries are, and it's got a concrete floor, and, and um, it's all painted white. And there's no and people come up to you and they have a a, a a laptop or a tablet, and they ask you how they can help, and you sit down and you have some coffee mm -hmm. and, and have a conversation. Care. Have a kind of little conversation, and um, your dog can come there and sit there with you, um, or your cat, or your snake, um, you can, or your snake, right? A little chair for the snake, um, and and, and uh, so that sounds pretty crazy. On the other hand, one of my readers, a group of people who read my book Zag, did exactly that in um, in Prague, and it spread to the rest of uh, Czech, uh, Czech Republic. Uh, it's called Airbank. 
and uh, you go in and the, everything's green and white and it's plastic and um, uh, fun and you know it's just and you can there's a sign on the window that says um, you know take off your shoes bring your food you know pets okay <laughs> the opposite stuff you sign up for an account you don't get 30 pages of contract to sign you get one simple page that you can understand you know they just did everything uh, they just fixed all the problems and reversed everything uh, and it's hugely successful okay and they're probably still learning and uh, improving stuff and uh, reacting on things uh, that are good or bad and, and building on that yes they are Continuous learning is, is very difficult for to do in companies and be innovative all the time. You might start out, out innovative, but then you get you get get sort of frozen in time. Is there like a go-to exercise that you recommend? And I know I'm asking for a lot uh, for companies to sort of keep on learning. I really think that there should be every company should have its own training program that's that's um, aligned with their own brand. They should develop their own. It shouldn't be something you could learn in at a university because anyone can get that information. They, they should have their, their own special branded training. Yes. So whatever whatever it is that's important to the success of that company, if it's continuous learning, then they should teach continuous learning. They should, you know, the meta skill of learning would be great. Um, and then you can put in some processes that um, make that real for people. I mean, one of the things that I did that I thought was really pretty successful was for Hewlett Packard, HP, back uh, 15 years ago. Uh, their company was a mess because they had acquired another company and the two cultures didn't really fit together very well. Um, and they had a culture of everyone for himself. Like every division, every region could make up its own rules and use its own brand elements. And so it was just a mess. It didn't look like a single company at all. Mm. And, um, and, and they, they find something that works and they just keep repeating that for endlessly until it didn't work. And then they find out that, gee, that product, uh, is no longer needed in the world. We got to start over. So there's no need for that. Really. You just have to have continuous innovation. So, uh, we work together with HP and, um, Uh, they had adopted the um, slogan of invent. Now, invent wasn't yes. for customers. It was for them. It was okay. Right? We need to invent. Let's be inventive. Let's design stuff and let's keep doing it. So because the com company was so uh, democratic in a way and diffused all over the world, um, it was really impossible to force anyone to do anything in a certain way. They just resisted it. It just wasn't in the culture of the company. So we tried something else. We created a competition, an annual competition around the HP brand, which included products and brand communications and processes and partnerships and just about everything the company did was part of the brand effort. And we would um, send out a call for entries and people would fill out a form and send in examples of something they had done that they think uh, pushed the company forward. And made a big deal out of judging it at three different levels, including outside famous people from the outside coming in and judging the final, uh, the final uh, winners. And then we made a big event out of it, three days, someplace in the world where people would be flown in, all the, the finalists would be flown in, and they'd be treated to great talks by important people and a big banquet and just like, you know, the Academy Awards. And they get a beautiful trophy if they were among the winners and... and Uh, and it just inspired everybody to do the right thing without without forcing them to do it. They wanted to do it. They wanted to be seen in the company. They wanted visibility. Um, and that just kept building on itself. And um, then we had a kind of internal magazine online line where we would take the winners and write an article about the team and how they did it and what the advantages of their solution were and what the takeaways were. So if you want to try it, here's what you should learn from this. And then we took those and made those case studies in a training program and we flew around the world to different regions and taught people how to be more creative and innovative. And that, that worked. And I think we, we ran it for five years until they finally knew enough about it that they could take it over internally. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, you know, it's, you, 
I don't know if that's a good solution for everybody, but for them, it was, it was, it was perfect. It was just what they needed given their size and their culture. Mm -hmm. Establish such a, like an internal university, establish a curriculum, mm -hmm. establish questions, answers, establish um, media people that are running such a show. And that could be from outside people, at least for a while until things uh, start to run smoothly. And then it has to be, done by people from the company themselves i i think because of think, uh, the better acceptance yeah and that's that would be in my view the one of the roles of the cbo chief brand officer to make sure that that is operating perfectly okay great um marty i'm i'm really fascinated by our uh, conversation um i have a, a, a last question uh And I think it shows a lot about you. You named a navigation point, a section of your website, Steal My Idea. Yes, yeah, Steal This Idea. Steal That's This right. Idea, right. And what on earth did you think to name this section that way? It's just uh, very different from everything else um, on the web. Uh, you know, it was just a feeling I had... Um, Now that, you, now that I think about it, I do know where that came from. I heard a story maybe 20 years ago about a rock and roll group that you may know called the Grateful Dead. And the Grateful Dead had um, a very fanatic group of, you know, fans. So, the, you know, their audience was, they just loved the Grateful Dead. And they'd show up for every concert. The same people would show up every time. <laughs> and... Um, whenever the Grateful Dead had new songs, there'd be people in the audience with high-end tape recorders, you know, taping these songs and then selling them to each other or making them available online. And the Grateful Dead were going, oh, wait a minute, they're, they're ruining our business, right? They're, they're, ta they're, they're, they're taking these recordings, which are not very good, mm -hmm. live, from somebody sitting in an audience, uh, and they're getting them out before we can even put them on vinyl um, and stealing our sales. And so they're trying to figure out what to do about that. And one of the people, not anybody in the group, but somebody like a man, the manager or something, he said, he said, we're just thinking about this wrong. These are our fans without, the, without our fans, we have nothing. If, if they want to, you know, steal some music and, and, uh, give it to each other, is that, is that theft or is that advertising? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I see. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought, I'm just, I know people are going to steal stuff out of my books. Why don't I just ask them to do it and make it easy and give them the actual slides, you know, give them the actual work <laughs> and they can put it in their slideshows or use it any way they want. Um, I don't even care if they use my name with it. I just want those ideas out there. Um, there's, yeah. not, we're, there's more where those came from. So I just keep coming up with new problems to solve and, Why not give them away? I mean, it's not like there's a limited number of these ideas. Right. There's just many, many ideas. And the good thing about ideas is once they are good for something, at least for a certain point in time, uh, they become something like a, a general thing of life that and it's accepted to uh, the and, and uh, the society accepts these ideas as, as their own and integrates that in, into the development of the society in that way a simple idea of a person a single person can become very very powerful if it sort of resonates with uh, lots of other people at yeah, this point of time seems organic and people don't even know where it came from so much the better it just seems true and and uh, uh, I, I, I get Sometimes I get people online, you know, in social media saying, oh, the brand gap, oh, that old thing, yeah, you know, or, or they'll say, you know, they'll say uh, oh, yeah, I read that book. Oh, this, you know, everybody knows all that stuff. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you have read the books. Uh, we have talked about it for a long time. We have discussed these things. And, um, yeah, then it's common they, knowledge. They were new at the time. Um And it reminds me of uh, a time my wife and I went, we were in London, and uh, we went to see Romeo and Juliet. And uh, on the way out, there were a couple of American, an American couple in front of us, and we heard them talking, and the man says, well, what did you think of the play? And she says, oh, I loved it. It's just that, you know, there were so many cliches. 
<laughs> I'm not comparing myself with Shakespeare, but I think the principle holds. It's just like after a while, uh, you know, when things become common knowledge, they sound like cliches. So, so Shakespeare wasn't such a big author. He just uh, stuck together lots of cliches. <laughs> Well, great. Thank you, Marty. Um, I think we should leave it at that. And thank you very much for taking the time of talking to me and uh, and adding something to that library of, uh, of the 2.5. Um, I think that was very, very helpful. And it was a great pleasure to talk to you. Likewise, class. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to my conversation with Marty Neumeyer on this episode of The 2.5, Conversations Connecting Innovators. You'll find all the links on the website. Simply head on over to the2.5.net. You'll find the link also in the show notes. If you like the show, subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Please also leave a review to help others discover the program. The music of this podcast was arranged by Imex. The 2.5 Conversations Connecting Innovators podcast is hosted in Baden-Württemberg in Germany. My name is Klaus. Until next time, take care and keep on being innovative.